<laughs> My name is uh, Philip Sadlick. I'm the president of publishing and marketing here at Boom Studios. Thank you so much for coming to the Boom Studios panel celebrating 10 years of pushing comics forward. Um, this is always a special uh, panel for me because I spent a decade uh, in Baltimore and I always think this is my hometown show. Um, I uh, have not missed one sit, uh, yet, well no, I take that back, I did miss one. Uh, and it was the only excuse that uh, Mark, who runs the show, would accept, which is my daughter was being born. But I made it to every other show and this is always really uh, special for me. Um, so if you've been to Comic-Cons, if you're a Comic-Con veteran, or even if this is your first Comic-Con, but you've been to a bunch of panels this weekend, you might notice that this panel is going to be a little bit different than a typical publisher panel. I'm going to introduce our panelists here in just a moment, and then I'm going to chat with you guys as a group for a few minutes before we jump into a discussion. Uh, I'm really hoping that this panel evokes some interesting and thought-provoking conversation and gets you guys thinking about uh, how you can help push comics forward, because here at Boom, we really believe that it is not just up to us as the publishers and these folks as the creators, but a big part of this is really you guys uh, as the fans. So, uh, I'm going to start off by introducing Mr. Mark Wade. So, I probably shouldn't have to introduce him, but I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, let you know that he is an award-winning comic book writer, a store owner, an editor, a publisher, uh, through his digital imprint, The Thrill Bent, clearly a very serious individual. Uh, King of I just want to, the read, I'm the guest of honor of the show. No, please, don't get up. <laughs> so this is, what, this is what I get. I get every, everything else is the same. I get a big paper hat. It's yeah. awesome. Yeah. awesome. So, Mark's credits are way too numerous to list, but include seminal works like Kingdom Come, Irredeemable, Daredevil, and Superman Birthright. He's currently working on Strange Fruit for Boom, Archie, uh, Princess Leia, S.H.I.E.L.D., and the all-new, all-different Avengers. Yeah. Uh, sitting right here is Mr. J.G. Jones. <laughs> Again, I should not need to introduce, but I will anyway. He is an Eisner Award-nominated painter, comic artist, cover artist. He's best known for his groundbreaking work on series like Marvel Boy, Final Crisis, Why the Last Man in 52 at Marvel and DC Comics. Uh, on top of that, he's the co-creator and artist of Wanted with uh, Mr. Mark Miller, who and that was adapted as a feature film a few years ago. And he is currently co-writing with Mr. Mark Wade and fully painting Strange Fruit for us here, but yes. fully painting because he is a glutton for punishment. Yes. yes. Uh, down there at the end is Ms. Brooke Allen, who is the artist and co-creator of the Eisner Award-winning Lumberjanes. <laughs> Brooke is relatively local. She's in the Washington, D.C. area, and prior to Lumberjanes, she wrote and drew a home for Mr. Easter, along with contributing various, uh, to various anthologies and, and, and cover artwork, and there is not, not a lot more about you on the internet, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> I, I can tell you, apparently, she can't hold her liquor. <laughs> <laughs> I've just, I've heard. Don't, awesome. <laughs> Don't tell Mark Wade anything. I <laughs> uh, sitting right here in the dazzling pink shirt that may have you thinking he is a Baltimore Comic Con minion because apparently they coordinated. If you guys need to know where anything is, just ask. <laughs> Mr. Uh, Brian Stelfreeze, uh, I think it's fair to say that Brian is the definition of an artist's artist. I can't think of any artist downstairs that does not look up to him and scratch their head at how he does what he does. He's worked for vir virtually every publisher in the business as a penciler, painter, inker, and colorist. And he recently completed a full eight issue run on Daymen here at Boom. And just this week was announced as the artist on Marvel's relaunch of Black Panther with, I'm gonna mispronounce his name right, I'll be on top of it, Tana Hase. Tana Hase Coates. James Tynan IV is a comic writer and master 
Master Karaoke MC. His work <laughs> includes Batman Eternal, Hellblazer Talon, Detective Comics, along with all of his awesome original series here at Boom, The Woods, Mimetic, Woo! Ufology, and the upcoming Cognetic. Yay! <laughs> and last but certainly not least, Daphna Plevin is one of Boom's most experienced editors. She began in the industry as a marketing assistant at the company and soon moved into editorial as uh, my editor-in-chief likes to steal people from my marketing department. Uh, she has shepherded the comic adaptations of many major brands that we all know and love, including Planet of the Apes, Sons of Anarchy, Sleepy Hollow, and many more. And she's worked with creators that include Mike Carey, George Perez, Dan Abnett, Paul Jenkins, and Jimmy Palmiotti. Currently, she is editing Lumberjanes, Wild's End, and Lantern City, among lots of others. Yay! Woo! So, indulge me as I continue to ramble on, uh, mostly because awkward silence really freaks me out. <coughs> not looking like you're going to talk a whole lot. All right. Here's the thing, guys. There's something amazing happening right now. And it's not just the comics have crossed over into the mainstream. That's plain to see. I mean, we can all look around and see the slate of Marvel movies and DC movies and TV shows. And there's, guys, there's two, not one, two Walking Dead TV shows on television right now, and they are all <coughs> anybody can talk about. It goes way beyond that. Fun Home just won five Tony Awards, including Best Musical. Comics are influencing fashion and books and winning awards that are major literary awards that we have not previously been recognized in. So that all is pretty obvious, I think. All of you in this room can see that. The amazing part is what has crossed over. And you, the fans, as a group, are changing. The comic audience is expanding, and many of you are interested in not just in one particular genre, but the medium itself. And right now, series none of us as publishers could have predicted five years ago are not just surviving, they are flourishing. And that's thanks to you. So the examples of this change are all around us. Just look at the three biggest publishers in comics. Marvel has had tremendous unexpected success with books like and characters like Miss Marvel, Miles Morales, and the unbeatable Squirrel Girl. A, Squirrel Girl, yeah. A diverse representational Avenger series is on the way. Falcon has stepped into the role, role of Captain America, and the Carol Horde are going strong. DC Comics has also discovered a new part of their fan base with titles like Batgirl and Gotham Academy, and so much more that they just announced and, and launched a massive revamp of their entire publishing line to make it more diverse and inclusive, including a varied group of creators, characters, and approaches. And among the three biggest publishers, I think it's safe to say that Image has been leading the charge for years with series like Saga, Sex Criminals, Chew, and Rat Queens, and pushing the envelope even further with new series like Bitch Planet, Wayward, and The Wicked and Divine. So if you've been at conventions in the last few years, you already knew this was coming. Conventions show us where the industry is headed, and recognizing the changing face of fandom, implementing initiatives to create a safe and welcoming environment for everyone. So whether you realize it or not, just by coming to these shows, you're an early adopter. Look around the floor today, and you'll see signs of the change all around you. We've come a long way, but we think we can go further. Mainstream publishers are starting to come around. And it's also important to note that while we're talking about a change in mainstream comics, the direct comic shop market, this is a movement that's been happening in web comics and indie comics for many years, as well as bookstores and libraries. So what's happening in comics, that's what's happening in comics right now. But why is it important to talk about it? I'm gonna indulge a little bit further and give you a personal anecdote. When I was in middle school, I discovered comics. And the kid who grew up reading and watching fantasy and sci-fi loved the aspirational nature that I saw in the medium. I was a short, skinny, Polish immigrant, and I saw myself reflected in comics. I was Peter Parker, I was Nightcrawler, I was Tim Drake, and what I wanted, what I want most right now is to give that same experience to my two daughters to allow them to see themselves reflected and inspired by this medium that I've made my life's work. And I think it is more possible now than ever. And as a community, 
I think we should want to see each and every one of you reflected back in the comics you buy and read. We all want to feel that same connection that I felt and continue to feel when I sit down and read a comic book. Comics need to be accessible. Many of you may have discovered comics through other mediums like film, or TV, animated shows, music, novels, video games. Or maybe you were drawn in by a unique subject matter or theme or mainstream award recognition or even word of mouth from friends and family. It's important for each of us to have an easy entry point into comics. It's critical that we stretch the boundaries of our media, not just with the content and the subject matter, but with the format, the design, the aesthetic, and that, that way comics can appeal not just to us, the existing fans, but to folks who have never ever would have guessed that there's a comic out there for them. We should want you, our readers, to feel empowered and inspired when you connect with the medium. Comic books have the power to do so much more than just entertain. And I want everyone that comes into our community to feel the same aspiration I had when I read my first comic. I think all of us are here because we believe comics, just like movies, books, music, should be for everyone. Ross, uh, the founder of the company, is fond of saying, you will never meet a person who has never seen a movie or watched TV or read a book or listened to music. But you can find lots of people that have never read a comic book. And we think it's critical that we change that. And it doesn't happen by accident. It takes work. So here at Boom, we've been proud to play our little part in this larger movement for years. And when we sat down to talk about our 10-year celebration, we felt like it presented a natural opportunity to shine a larger spotlight on our work. Now, the conventional approach would be to celebrate what we've already done, to kind of take a victory lap, get our kumbayas on, high five, get, get our pats on the back. And make no mistake, we are grateful for the last 10 years, for the support that every one of you, in particular our fans, have shown us. And we don't take for granted for a second the risk you take every time you choose to back a fresh idea, a new voice, or a unique format. But we didn't want to talk about the past. We wanted to talk about the future, the next 10 years. Because when we come, when we come to work every day, that's what gets us most excited. That's what we're thinking about. The most exciting things are just over the next 10 years. The best comics have yet to be published. And the creators up here are uh, part of that future. So this conversation led us to push comics forward. Push Comics Forward is something where we wanted to lend our voice to a larger conversation, one that's already been happening all around us, and in particular, online. We want Push Comics Forward to be a movement to define what we think the next 10 years of comics should look like. And it's not about boom, but we felt like it was important that a mainstream top 10 publisher take a public stance. And we can't do it alone. That's why we've encouraged press, creators, retailers, other publishers, and industry professionals, and even you, the fans, especially you, the fans, to keep this conversation going. So our commitment to you uh, and the industry is to continue to provide content that will appeal not just to the existing fan base, but to new readers who have yet to discover comics. Our goal is firmly focused on bringing new people into this amazing community. And now, I'm done talking. I'd like to have some of our amazing creators share their experiences and talk about what they'd like to see from comics and I'd love it if you guys think of questions and, and things that you're curious about as well. All right guys, that's, uh, that's my big roundup to all this. Um, so first question, uh, where would you guys like to see the industry go in the next few years, in the next 10 years, or where do you think it's headed? Anybody want to go first? Mark Wade, not afraid. Yeah, yeah, not afraid. Not afraid. <laughs> We're really in the right direction, like you said. I mean, because it's one of the things that's helping us greatly is digital distribution. Because for the longest time, one of the reasons that nobody for generations has read comics is because you couldn't buy them in, you know, corner stores anymore. You couldn't find them everywhere. They were a specialty shop. And there's there's I mean, we take for granted in a city like this. How, you know, how many comic stores there are, how accessible the material is, but there are still entire, entire states in the United States where there's maybe one comic shop. And so we can't run like, like you know, beef is what's for dinner or got milk ads for comics because you can get milk anywhere, you can get, but you can't get comics anywhere. That was the truth back up until three or four years ago. Now, luckily, through services like Comixology or other things like that, 
we're able to get our comics to anybody who has internet access or any sort of platform. And that is enormously helpful because the demographics of comic stores are also, you know, guys like me, or guys who look like you can be related to me, which is <laughs> awesome. But we need a bigger audience. You, you, than that. You're talking about guys with crowns on their I'm talking about guys with crowns on their <laughs> Jughead. <laughs> um, Jughead's you know. not real. Well, no, okay. Well, neither am I. Um, so there's that. There's a, but you, you know, so, so that digital distribution opens up the audience to everybody. And that will help feed new creators coming to us in the years to come. I think that. This is a long answer, but I swear it's worth it. That my observation. Okay, nobody else wanted to talk. Nobody else wanted to talk. You're you're lost. Um, my observation has been for a long time. It is absolutely true. It is absolutely true that there are not enough people of color. There are not enough guys who people who aren't white males working in comics. On the creative end, there's not enough. <laughs> Did you know that? Did you know that? <laughs> <laughs> enough. <laughs> so, maybe more like, you know, make up for that, but, <laughs> but some of that is because for 20, 25, 30 years we have catered very much to a, a white male audience, and so therefore we don't have a huge number of non-white male guys coming looking for jobs in comics. We should. That would be awesome. And we should do a better job of going out and seeking and recruiting. But the other thing that will help us is making comics for a broader audience, I think, will help that audience go, oh, I can be a part of that. Before this, I couldn't really be a part of that. Now, clearly, I can be a part of that. I think that's enormously helpful. So there you go. Uh, and to jump on top on that, I, I really think that there's like I think a lot of what you're talking about has already really been happening, and uh, I think the conversation, especially conversations like this, when we're, we're, we're when we talk about comics, we are, we we tend to be talking about the direct market, um, just the you know fl single floppy comics that you know you buy in a comic book shop. Um, but the conversation is much bigger than that, and I think that what we're seeing right now is a seismic shift that frankly, publishers need to get on top of. It's the fact that the book that nobody talks about in these settings that should it should be leading the conversation is the best-selling comic book in the United States, which is Smile by Raina Tegel Tegelman. That, is, that book is, like, that book is being read so, like, it's been on the New York Times bestseller list for three years now? Too, too, many, too, too many weeks to count. Yeah. Um, it is, and that is phenomenal. But the thing is, is like I feel like the shift really started back in. It, it started really with web comics, and web comics uh, influenced also by the manga boom right at the turn turn of the twentieth century. That was the that was the moment twenty uh, first century. Uh, that was the moment that all of a sudden there was an influx of new comic material that wasn't just superheroes. And there were comics that literally you could find yourself reflected in so many different ways uh, on the stands, as we saw in bookstores when the like the manga section went from half of one shelf to a full like standing shelf to an entire wall of books, and uh, and then you know shrank back down again a year, a couple of years later. But uh, but the thing is, is that in that time, like a whole new generation of readers started reading, and they don't like. We're, we have an entire generation of uh, young artists coming up right now whose main influences in their art styles, they, they couldn't even name the super, a superhero book that, that, that would be an influence on them. Their influences come from everything around them. They come, and it's, we, we see that in the dramatic shift in like, art styles in comics in the last few years where it's just like, a diversity of style is now a very, very big thing. And uh, it's fascinating. And I think, but the, the, the point I was trying to make is more just that it's happening. The, new, the next generation of comics readers and writers and artists is female. Like, 100%. Like, I don't think it's even close. Um, I, like, the people who I see coming up right now 
uh, especially on the art side, are like it's it is a female market, yeah. and uh, that that is just going to like feed itself in the same way that that's been true in the book market for years and years and years. Like uh, young female readers are the reason that Harry Potter, Twilight, um, The Hunger Games sold as m many copies as they did because young girls read more than young boys. Um, and you know, in the comics industry, it took a long time to figure that out, and they're still trying to figure that out because they don't understand that, like, okay, this book isn't going huge, up, isn't selling huge right off the bat in the direct market, so it must not like be reaching that audience. But then the trade comes out, and then it's just a monumental hit over and over and over again because that's where the readers are. And I think a lot of it is sort of finding where the readers are, and I think we will figure it out, but. Like, because I think the answers are pretty clear, but it's just like how to shift how the direct market works in right now is the real discussion that I, I think we all need to be having to actually reach out to those people. And I think digital is a big part of that.
talk a little bit more about that is that idea of um, kind of, you know, people that were in the minority, particularly in the, in the comics industry for years, kind of having to conform yeah. to house styles or kind of perceptions of how they should create, right? Um, and, and maybe, I don't know that there's much more to say about that other than it, it does really feel like that's changing, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I really do feel like it's changing. Again, I had, you know, having done this for 30 years, I, I remember, you know, being at a point in my career when people wouldn't hire Colleen Duran to draw things because she drew like a girl. And right. This is absurd <laughs> and ridiculous. But but we've I've seen that change. It's not that it hasn't changed completely and it hasn't changed overnight, but it, it, it is getting better in that sense. And and no one say that. Part of that is also because, and I say this with all the respect for the world for superheroes who have been very, very good to me, comics is, you know, comics is less and less and less about superheroes every year, which is great. Because that means that throws open the genres to 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 anything and it makes other styles a little bit more, you know, valuable in the industry, if you will. You don't have to just be able to draw spandex and caves in order to get a gig. like, oh, James can't write it, but if I were open, they'd be like, oh, he can't, like, they, they would just never be able to think of me as someone who did that. And the, I think part of it is, like, you know, when I came out, uh, it was, you know, uh, there was no blowback, and then now I'm writing, uh, I'm one of the head writers of Batman and Robin Eternal, and I'm writing all of the Robins, so, like, you know, and now I get to make them all gay. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. So the gay agenda is working. And, uh, yeah, no, I. But it's like I, I remember reading books growing up, and the uh, like. It, it, I've talked about this before, but it used to be something where uh, to see any aspect of queerness in the in the comics. Uh, like it, there would be jokes, there'd be homophobic jokes that I'd be like, "Ooh, they acknowledged homosexuality exists by making fun of it," and it was just like, "This is this is a victory," like you know, and uh, like, th and those would be like moments that I would be like, I would go back and read those books over and over because they were the only ones on my shelves that actually acknowledged that a person like me existed, and uh, and then there there are other things where it's just like you know. I know that uh, there, like, it, 
there was a run on uh, X Men uh, by Chuck Austin that you know has gotten a lot of flack over the years, but meant a lot to me because uh, it had North Star having a crush on a uh, on Iceman, who at that point was a straight character, um, and it was just like yeah, and. Uh, and it was just like, uh, that was my every day. My every day was like having a crush on plenty of straight characters. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so that was, you know, I sort of lost my train there. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm talking. I'm talking. I mean, it was awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let me throw out a, a, another question just to kind of take the conversation in a, diff a slightly different way, which is, you know, this is a, a great uh, convention example of, a, of a, an environment that's very welcoming attracts people from all sorts of different backgrounds. What, ha, have any of you had any experiences this weekend here at the show that you kind of had that like moment of like, oh wow, like that really is an indication of the, of the change. And like, uh, you know, as an example for myself, I still, I've been in this industry long enough where I still find it weird, like pleasantly weird, but weird when I see like a father walk up to the booth with his young daughter and they're looking for a book to share. And I get really excited, but it feels like still kind of odd. I'm, I, keep, I keep looking around to see like, wait, did, how did well, they get in here? That's <laughs> like when, you, when, you, when you see the bored, the bored boyfriend who's been dragged along. Yes. 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 Expected to, you know, he's he's been going to this kind of convention for years and years and years and years and conventions all over the country. Um, but then, and so I always assume it's like, okay, this guy's going to come up and he's going to put a stack of Batman's in front of me. And then when he pulls out a full run of the woods and like my Sensation Comics story that I did with Noel Stevenson and all of that, and just starts digging into like why he likes this stuff, and it's like. That, those are the moments that like I still get like taken aback by because it's just like okay the, because now the, the like the old guard is shifting as well like the, the the new stuff is just like it's good comics and good comics can look like anything and people who have been loving comics their entire lives are seeing things that they might not have like 10 20 years ago they would never would have expected that they would ever pick up in a comic shop and they, now they're reading them and loving them and that that is also tie into that also, uh, just as, as an artist and, and as a comic fan, uh, there's, a, 
there is a tried and true formula for a lot of comics that's been this way forever. And it's kind of, I mean, really, you, you had things where if Raza Ghoul shows up on the last page of a Batman comic, then that's a good Batman comic. Mm -hmm. You know, you, it could be written terribly. But, <laughs> but Raza Ghoul showed up on the last page, so it's great. Uh, but now, because things have just opened up, um, you have comics that don't have fans, that don't have a single fan attached to the comic. So that comic has to come out, and it has to be good, and it has to generate fans. Whereas the next issue of X-Men is going to do fine. Um, they don't have to prove anything. They can do like an entire issue where the character is sitting around clipping their toenails. And, uh, and you know, 100,000 people will buy it. So, so the quality doesn't have to be there. But I think the coolest thing now that they're getting all of this diversity and all of this new stuff, because they don't have a single fan, these books have to be good. They don't have a choice but to be good, or they will remain not having a single fan. And, and you know, it's interesting because one of the things I've been talking, uh, I, I, I was asked by another publisher at this Diamond Held Retailer Summit right before this, and so a lot of the publishers are friendly and we're talking, and um, a, a newer publisher asked me, you know, we're saying, Oh, congratulations on the stuff that you guys have that's working that's being very complimentary. Um, and you know, how do you, as a publisher, the question you always get is how do you generate the next hit, right? How how do you do the next thing that's going to work? And the thing science. that it's science, <laughs> which is why we publish nothing but smash hits. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, one of my favorite quotes from, uh, from Robert Kirkman was he was asked once, hey, what do you think makes The Walking Dead so successful? And he said, and I don't know too many kids in here, he said, oh, hell, I don't know. If I knew, I'd have a hundred of them. <laughs> you know, like he, his answer was like, I don't know what people respond to, but here's, here's what I think, here's my develop, developing theory of what I think it is. All the things that have worked for us in the last few years have been when we've gone to the creators and we've said, tell the story that you're passionate about. What is the song in your heart? You know, what is the thing that, um, you know, James, we talk about how kind of the challenge that, you know, Scott Snyder threw to you is yeah. before you pitch your first original project, make it the one that you would write for the rest of your life. Right. You know, and, and, and I think, you know, when we talk about all the projects we've done together, you know, movement and <coughs> you guys, that, that's a common thread. It's something that, story you had to get out or had to be a part of or, you know, there's a real personal component there. I mean, that part is critical. It's, at, working editorially, the first question I ask writers when they pitch a story is, what is it about the story that makes you really want to tell it? I don't care about the plot details. I don't care about the page-by-page the -page breakdown at this point. Tell me what excites you about this story. And if you don't get a clear answer to that, or they have to think, or there's a pause, or they have to ruminate over it, then don't publish it. That's not that's not to anybody's best interest. Jeff, don't talk so much, please. <laughs> you know, actually, I should be sitting down there just listening. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually great. I'm enjoying myself. Um, now I have to turn the brain on and say something. Um, the reason I wanted to work with you guys at Boom and bring it back to the theme. Boom! Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Ross appreciates the plug. Um, we, we looked around for, you know, different homes for this project before we came back and talked to you guys about doing it. And I just, I love your statement of characters and writers and artists and like Mark said, nothing against superhero books. They've been great to us yeah. for years. But I think I've done those stories now, and I want to do different kinds of stories. And if uh, young kids will let me come play along with you, you know, I'll find them cool and I'll be good, I promise, <laughs> for the most part. Um, I really enjoyed working uh, people with open minds and putting out just a variety of great products. Yeah. Thanks, man. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Right. So I would like to
to just let me just ask you guys, like what what are the kind of things that you didn't see in comics five or ten years ago excite you now? What are some of the stuff that either whether it's a title or a grade or anything like that, what is the kind of stuff that you're not you that again surprises you that wasn't around when you were growing up but now you you really like? What what well, it's interesting for me because I didn't get into, like, American comics until I started working at the shop I work at now about three years ago. <laughs> so I read manga uh, for probably obvious reasons. Comics, American comics for me, were intimidating. I didn't feel like, like, I, I felt like it was a, a boys club, which at the time I didn't even realize that was my mentality. But um, the thing I really like about... <laughs> image and boom particularly it's their stories even if I can't necessarily directly relate to the characters because most of them have like superpowers and stuff um, you can relate to their personalities and their experiences and like two of my favorite books right now are Lumberjanes in the Woods <laughs> and it's I I found characters that had experience is similar to mine and it's like something that, like I was listening to your story James and I was like literally getting emotional about it because it's it's like really close to my heart and that's not something I ever saw like in comics for me growing up and I'm sure that some of those existed but they weren't like at the forefront at all and like just as a little end, end cap, I just want to say, like, what you guys are writing and doing is, like, it's just so important, <laughs> and I love it so much, and you guys really make make the comics world better, like, it, more welcoming, and, and it's easier, right? It's easier as a retailer to, like, sell it to people. Like, what, do you, what shows do you watch? What do you like? What are you into? I have... Uh, hundred books over here pick one <laughs> and it, it's you know if they don't like superheroes then they're almost more not superhero books than there are superhero books and I've gotten into superhero books trust me I love them I love those too yeah yeah I'm so excited as to my own story yeah and I'm so excited that the majority of the books that we carry are not superhero books anymore. I think that's awesome because I want there to be superhero books, but I also want there to be science fiction and western and comedy and horror and all that stuff. Yeah, totally. So, um, even though it's another publisher, um, the it's whole publisher. yeah, no, well, <laughs> well, you know the 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 reason why I I picked up Saga is because I I opened the first page of the first issue, and Alana was giving birth, and I had just become a father, so that book really spoke to me. And so what I like that Boom and all the other, um, you know, the, the more indie publishers than the big two are doing is they have comics for, like, every age and every situation, um, you know, and I've always, I've always thought, you know, I know why money-wise they can't do it, but I would love to see Marvel, you know, take Wolverine and what is he like as an old man or, you know, like, let them age and, like, as I'm aging, I want to see them do different things, you know, I want to see them as old people, as I'm getting older, you know, like what I liked as a, as an eight year old and nine year old when I first got into comics is different than what I like to see now. And so I love the fact that, you know, you guys have, you know, there's comics with kids and comics with all, you know, women casts and stuff like that. And, you know, I had a daughter and until I had a daughter, I didn't realize like how male centric the comics world was. So I'm glad that now, you know, like you said, based on what was coming out in the webcomic world where people didn't have to worry about demographics or what marketing said, um, there's a lot more books that are for women. And it's not like a special issue, everything's pink, although that can be cool for some people. Um, I, think, I think it's neat where it can be a book that can come from a woman's point of view or have a, a woman's gaze instead of a male gaze, you know, like the whole Hawkeye initiative, all those type of things.
sub. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. I always just kind of industry kind of ended up getting into print and getting involved with uh, publishers uh, like y'all. Um, but something that I kind of grew to expect in webcomics and kind of liked seeing it, but also just kind of expected to see it, was seeing queer representation, seeing bisexual characters and other non-monosexual characters. And I'm finally beginning to see that in in print more recently, more commonly. Like, if, sure, you know, it happened before, but wasn't necessarily at the uh, forefront, as has been said at this panel. But um, that's something that I didn't expect to see five or ten years ago. I just assumed I'm going to walk into a comic shop. I'm going to expect not to see that at all. And it's been really, really great to begin to see that shift happen in print. Yeah. Well, I think one of the things we talk about at the office a lot is it's great right now that there's, for example, more female creators coming in and more queer creators coming in and being represented and, and, and creating those characters and those types of books that reflect their point of view. I think, you know, one of the things we've talked about this year at, when we do this panel is that clearly the industry still has a, a long, long way to go in terms of representation of people of color and other uh, underrepresented groups. But I think, you know, one of the things I think about is looking into the future and, and hoping what the industry should look like in 10 years is right now I think we still, you know, to our detriment, uh, uh, market things as, you know, all new creative team. And, and, and look, like, it's, it's, it's important given where we are. You know, it was important that Lumberjanes was from an all-female creative team starring an all-female cast. But where I would love to be is when, where we finally have that representation and that accessibility, and it's just, you know, great creators and great characters, and we're not thinking, like you say, the, the, the great thing about webcomics is it's just a given. You know, it's not a big deal, you know, that such and such superhero uh, suddenly turns out to be gay. You know, like, it, it's, just, it's just part of the story, and I think one of the things that, you know, James and, and, and Brooke and all the people on this panel have done very, you know, elegantly is introduced characters and it's not the focus of the story. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you guys have any questions or any ideas you want to share? Anything? Oh, um, just a couple things. Um, uh, what I see on the industry is that um, there is a strive to give something for everybody. Um, whereas, you know, when we grew up, it was either Camp DC or Camp Marvel and a lot of mindless brawls or that. Um, I worked in comics retail in the early 90s, so there was a bit of misogyny back then, so the few girls that would strike <laughs> yeah. were, the, were the prototype. And, you know, like, you know, people were like, oh, what are you doing here? Or is it, did, um, are you the girlfriend of somebody else behind comics? And once in a while, someone would have the guts to go and buy some, and I, I would kind of like give her a little applause, you know. And I, I like to see that this uh, audience uh, for comics is well represented across the board. Uh, and the comments are trying to meet those demands, and, um, and especially the in independents are just getting a lot more power than they used to back then, because 
I was there when um, you know Image just got started, and um, you know it was all it was all a big big hit back then. But it was still back then, you know DC Marvel, DC Marvel. Um, but for me, everything was game changing when you know, Usagi Ujimbo came out and Cerebus. You know, it just shows that an independent comic can develop a huge worldwide cult audience. And now look what's going on. I mean, there's so much diversity and so many ideas coming out. That I just love what's going on. Hi. Hi. And it's like our third year or fourth. Uh, we passed some booths, you know, it's like an independent guy, as he was saying, like a self-publisher. He's the writer, he's the artist, he's doing everything, trying to sell something to recoup. And I, I would assume he's probably contacted the various companies like Boom and whatever, you know, it's like, you know, trying to get them to buy it. And got the standard reject letter. Uh, but do y'all ever kind of like walk these uh, conventions and, and say, oh, that looks pretty interesting. Here, call me. And anything gone from there? Relentless. Yeah, All actually, over the country. Yeah, and Daphne could speak to that because she's, she's an editor. Um, I mean, yeah, it's well, one of the biggest things as an editor is you always kind of want to look out for exciting voices. And it's not just like, it's not just the same. I think that's part of the problem of the, the old guard of the industry. is very incestuous. It's very much people moving from one book to another book. And it's all the people that you know. And thanks to the web, but also thanks to comic conventions, it's been Rome and be exposed to new things and new voices in a very uh, active way. Um, so we, we often, like I, I walk artists out like every day, small publishers, I know Ross does, Philip does. And, and, and in fact, you know, Brooke self-published the, the, the graphic novel by herself that she wrote for the movie for him, which is I think what got, got the attention. Whitney, our assistant editor, Alana James, uh, has an amazing eye for you. She often goes to SBX and meets artists there, and so it's, it's a big part of our job, not just something we do uh, when we remember. And one of, the, one of the things I think as a publisher that we take great pride in is that we consistently break new voices into the industry. You know, a lot of what, some of what makes it challenging to do my job, which is to sell our books to, to retailers, is a lot of times I'm saying, okay, this is a great new project from two people you've never heard of before, you know, and, and so we, we try to sell it on the merit of the idea and on the on the creative talent uh, on the book, but it's um, you know it's a challenge we relish because we we think that the next great idea could come from anywhere. You know, it could be in this room. Hi. <laughs> um, I hope I don't mangle this. Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, I think that it just to me. The, the reason that um, we're all here having this discussion and that we're, we're seeing all these great things coming forward in comics now and that the industry is becoming more inclusive is mainly twofold. You know, firstly, 30 to 40 years after the comic book was invented, the internet came into being, right? And so all of us who were sitting at home reading our comic books, you know, maybe reading something that was kind of obscure, we could suddenly go online and connect with other people who are reading the same thing. And, and a fan base could grow and connect. And uh, secondly, we eventually, as, as fans, as an audience, were given the tools to sort of take the story into our own hands and tell you guys which stories were for us. Because, you know, we all could fall in love with the story, the canon, as it were, and the history of what's happened to these characters. But then we would go, oh, wouldn't it be cool if, or, you know what I'd really like to happen? And then there's headcanon. And then we write it down and we tell people about it, and that's fan fiction. And, and that's, you know, that sort of becomes this whole spin-off thing, which is spilled into not just comic books now, but, but things for TV shows and books and movies. And Did you know that happened? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, like, but that's where we felt safe. We didn't feel that's safe in a comic store. We found people who liked what we liked online because we didn't feel safe going to a comic store, and we said, screw you, universe, we can make our own. Um, and it's cool to see it crossover because there's a lot of people who make their bones in fandom, um, doing fanfic, and, and that's how you learn to write because you've got a community of like peers who are actually peer reviewing your work yeah, and taking it. <coughs> so that's not to, I had a conversation with him. In defense of, of the word fanfic, which is often used as a pejorative, my feeling is unless you created it, it's all fanfic. Yeah. 
I never use that in pejorative yeah. sense. <laughs> uh, you know, you understand, I, I hear it and Wait, I just think I can first look that up. I sometimes hear it uses pejorative and, and, and I read it as like a, like a whistle for a, a girl wrote it or yeah, it's for yeah, girls. Yeah. Yeah. You hear it's like, oh, that's like fanfic because there's like romance in it. I'm like, yeah. I know what you're saying. Mark Wade has written my favorite Daredevil fanfic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why, thank you. Why, thank you. The fanfic was great. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we've got just a couple minutes left, so why don't we get uh, one or two more questions and then we'll try to wrap up and get everybody out of here so we can have Okay, so I have one comment and one question. Um, so I'm a playwright. I also got a degree in econ when I was in college, and one of the kind of societal teaching things that came around was this, this idea that diversity is valuable, not because the story is about you. Like, queer stories aren't valuable to me because I'm queer. I'm not. They're valuable to me because I am not. Like, it's, it's valuable to me to cross the bridge that I have not crossed before. And that's something that's valuable in fiction because, like, I don't know. Did you guys see the movie about the handsome white guy who saved the world? Right? <laughs> and so, like, eventually you just have to tell the stories that aren't told yet, um, which is usually about, you know, like, Arab people. It's like 1% of the population is Muslim, so you don't get a lot of Muslim stories. Inherently, that's fresh. It's novel. Um, but one of the questions I had just sort of as a panel of the creative team, you guys talked about Miles and Ms. Marvel, and those are the, like, the only two Marvel subscriptions I have right now, or to those two comics. Would you rather, if you were going to, in like sort of the grand can, uh, canon of current superheroes, would you rather recontextualize a s existing superhero to be some other identity, be it ethnic or sexual, or even gender, or would you rather introduce a new character? Because I feel like the industry is kind of like, well, we want new characters and we want Arabs, but instead we're just going to make Miss Marvel Arab because people kind of know like the title as opposed to the character. Here's the issue that I think is uh, behind a lot of that and why you see like you know Falcon as Captain America, um, those kinds of recontextualizations that are happening. Um, it's the fact that people try to create new characters for the big two and they don't stick. They don't stick anymore because the thing is when you when you're sitting when you're at when you're at a comic shop and you see a new number one that isn't a superhero comic that's a pure expression of uh, of a thing and exactly what it wants this to be and then you see something that trying to uh, like you see a new su brand new superhero and it has a Marvel look but you don't know that superhero the reason you go to the superhero corner is that kind of familiarity to a certain degree so I think you do kind of in the current market you kind of have to like it like Miss Marvel was a name that like you know ever since uh, uh, Carol became Captain Marvel uh, there you know the name wasn't being used and that I think that's a perfect time to be like, okay, this is something that makes it part of a legacy, and you read comics because of legacy, you read superhero comics because of legacy, because of the, you know, the world and the all of that. But I think one of the big things is, is I think that we're going to see the dramatic shrinking of the superhero comics industry in the next ten years, um, and I think that, <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, I, I, I'd love to hear what other people think about that, but I think that's inevitable right now. I, I think that, frankly, I think the, the what I keep, keep pointing to are the Star Wars books right now, as I bet that is what uh, Marvel and DC will look like that line, maybe about, maybe a little bigger, than, uh, 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 definitely like twice as big as that, but it's like, you know, imagine there were 10 to 15 core books, there's a central core title that drives the core, that, and it would work like the Marvel movies work, and it's just like each universe sort of does that, that's where you get your big bombastic superheroes, but for anything else, for a pure expression of any other idea, you just do the pure expression, you don't do the pure expression filtered through superheroes. Like, you don't need to play with that filter anymore, unless that is the pure expression of what you're trying to do. Like, I think for a long time, you only could do those stories as superhero stories, and that's why it was valuable to do them as superhero stories. So. I also, I also think that superhero. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm much louder in the office. Don't worry. This is the chef. But um, <laughs> what I, what I like about actually recontextualizing and changing um, the gender or the sexuality or the race of, of classic heroes, and I'm more of a fan of taking, you know, taking Steve Rogers and changing him versus creating. Characters because you get to ride on the coattails of history. Comics are 
comics used to sell millions. Now we do healthy numbers, but it's not millions. And as a cultural signifier, you can then, you know, Captain America appears in movies, in animation, in books, in video games, and in comics. And if you change one of them, they filter through the rest. You know, the most familiar Green Lantern for a large generation, John Stewart, because he was in the cartoon. And so by changing one aspect of a familiar character that only has decades, I mean, since the 40s and 50s of history, you have the ability to impact so much of pop culture. And so even as superhero comics themselves are, are becoming a segment instead of the entire industry, you can still use that valuable cultural currency to uh, create a more diverse present. All right, unfortunately, that's all the time we have today. I want to, first of all, thank you guys for joining us. You know, it's the end of the day on Saturday. Really appreciate you spending this hour with us and, and contributing to the conversation. Uh, before we go, I just want to, you know, again, reiterate that everyone here at Boom, and I think the creators that work at Boom, uh, from the top down, we're committed to pushing comics forward. It's not a, a, a fad for us. It's not something that we just came upon uh, yesterday. You know, we've, we've been doing it for a long time, and we're committed because we sincerely believe in broadening the medium, making it more accessible, inclusive, optimistic. God, we need more optimism in this industry. Progressive and representational, and we think it's the right thing to do. Um, and you're seeing it in your stores and online already. Uh, it, we believe that comics can be and are for everyone. If you believe in the same thing, we invite you to join the conversation. You know, take it online. We, we have a hashtag push comics forward. Feel free to use it to help us create some momentum to the conversation and, and, and keep it present and in the forefront for everybody. And then in, in your own way, with your friends and family, please share the books that you think broaden the medium uh, because it'll only help create more like that. Thank you so much, everyone.